From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Tech sector hiring slows, heat and trains reveal new infrastructure woes, and TikTok's news influence grows. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, some opinion, and definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Renee Gutman, the former CISO at Campbell Soup, Coca-Cola, and Time Warner. Renee, thank you so much for being on the show. Happy Friday and glad to be here. Absolutely. We're going to dive right into the headlines. We've got about 20 minutes, so let's make this happen. First up here, we kind of have a uh, uh, two stories that were we paired together related definitely, and we really want to get your take on these. First up, Microsoft cuts security jobs amidst a weakening economy. Microsoft announced this week it plans to eliminate open jobs, impacting its Azure cloud business and security software unit as the economy continues to weaken. The company said it's honoring job offers they have already been made for open roles. The move follows similar hiring slowdowns announced by Google, Apple, pretty much any tech earnings call you're hearing, you're hearing about uh, slowing down of hiring. At the same time, kind of our second story here, dozens of cities and towns are paying tech workers to abandon Silicon Valley. A growing number of cities and towns all over the U.S. are handing out cash grants and other perks to draw skilled employees of faraway companies to live there and work remotely. In October, there were at least 24 such programs in the U.S. Today, there are 71. That's according to the Indianapolis-based company Make My Move, which is contracted by cities and towns to set up these programs. So seems like they would know the numbers pretty well. All the major one-word name companies like Amazon and Google have been active in this type of program. And in some cases, local governments offering up to things like $12,000 dollars in cash, along with subsidized gym memberships, free babysitting and office space uh, to make that switch. So, Renee, you know, these two stories, two different perspectives on the tech sector employment front, which up until now has been, let's just say, bullish, to say the least. Uh, what are the perspectives um, from, your, uh, from you on the changing hiring market, both from this apparent contraction, as well as an increase in remote work outside the Silicon Valley commuting belt? So a couple things. I heard today that the tech sector hiring has dropped by about 10% in the last month, and that's a lot, right? And I feel bad for people that are losing jobs or are counting on jobs, especially at some of these big companies. Um, that said, we talked about budget at RSA, and a lot of people thought that in cyber, the budgets would stay the same. So maybe this month, we only have 690,000 openings instead of 700,000, but it's still a lot. So I heard this week that the government is actually starting an apprenticeship program to train people in cyber. And I think this is my idea. We move a lot of really smart people into these cities and towns. We train people at the local community colleges and the, and then the, they intern at the municipal governments and they basically start fixing some of our infrastructure in these smaller towns. So that's my idea. Yeah, that would be brilliant. I mean, because so often, you know, we, we've seen these, especially uh, around election time, as, as that's getting closer now, you know, we, we, we see these stories that, uh, uh, you know, local governments are, are have all these vulnerabilities, you know, they're just not able to keep up. I love that idea of being like, hey, we can like we can have both benefits of this, right? We can we can unpack, you know, have a less dense uh, Silicon Valley, more affordable cost of living and have this very valuable service and get people trained to fill in all these very needed jobs. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a great win for everybody. That would be a virtuous uh, cycle indeed, and I like uh, the way your mind is thinking here. We've got another paired story here, so same kind of deal. Let me let me set it all up here. Uh, Canadian Airlines suffered delays and cancellations due to the Zayo outage. Another Canadian internet outage stories, if you'll recall the Rogers outage from two weeks ago. Air travel across Western Canada was impacted last Thursday by an internet outage impacting the country's air navigation service provider, Nav Canada. This was due to a disruption in the network of Zayo, a telecommunications provider based in Colorado that Nav Canada uses in part of the country's western region. This wasn't a cyber attack, but was instead caused by a train derailment that disrupted two key fiber lines managed by one of Zayo's fiber providers in Canada. Then, meanwhile, a heat wave forced Google and Oracle to shut down in London as record temperatures hit much of the UK on Tuesday. Tech giants Oracle and Google suffered outages as cooling systems failed in London data centers. Oracle explained that the unseasonably high temperatures getting up to, I think, 40 degrees Celsius in some points in London forced the data center units to operate above their design limits. Overheating also hit a Google Cloud data center in London at around 6 p.m. Uh, local time there. So, uh, Renee, from a cybersecurity perspective, these two stories, I think, have a chilling message about the fact that 
Infrastructure remains this key weak point. Nav Canada outage caused by physical damage on buried cables. In London, basically overtaxed air conditioning. And let's just tack on some uh, uh, you know realities of climate change uh, also as well. It, is it at all feasible for governments and companies to reassess infrastructure security, almost, in, in, I guess, a infrastructure supply chain, essentially, say, for example, to avoid threat actors sabotaging an air conditioning system instead of going for a heavily fortified network? Look, these stories, they're both troubling, and they're troubling for a lot of reasons, um, because it just shows how complica- uh, how complicated our systems are and how much we really do rely on, uh, on electric, water, you know, internet service providers, cloud security, uh, cloud providers. Um, I think companies are going to have to go back in and look at um, their disaster recovery and their business continuity plans and really determine whether they reflect accurately what can go wrong in today's kind of, you know, this this complex environment. And secondly, I do think that governments do need to play a stronger role here um, and that they need to really investigate and they need to force some investment. And this is where I want to go with this. They need to force investment and innovation in critical infrastructure. For example, you know, part of the story around uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the heat outage, it actually said that, that Microsoft had tested an underwater data center that um, was using natural cooling provided by the surrounding seawater. That, to me, is innovative. I've also heard that there's technology that can help um, trains to see what's on the track ahead of them to be able to avoid derailments. My position is the government needs to force investment, they need more oversight, and innovation needs to start happening in this area. What we can't have is driverless cars and uh, trains derailing in the same decade. Yeah, uh, for sure. And yeah, Microsoft for for a couple of years now has been trialing like these either, they, I mean, they've been doing stuff like sunken data centers, data centers on barges, but yeah, kind of utilizing that as a key way. And yeah, it's, it's almost, um, you know, we're kind of paying the piper, I think, for a lot of infrastructure debt. You know, we talk about technical debt a lot uh, for, for a number of reasons, but infrastructure debt becoming a availability concern, if nothing else, which, you know, becomes then a vector for cyber threats if people want to target those, right? We need to design for security and we need to design for resiliency if we're going to stay ahead of the game. And uh, 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 Robin Norris uh, in our uh, LinkedIn chat uh, said, Canadian and UK issues both fall back on the lack of resilient business continuity planning. Uh, and and that's the only time I believe a smiley face has been done and related to a lack of business continuity planning. So uh, thank you for that, Robin. Uh, excellent point. Completely agree. Uh, before we move on to our next story, of course, we have to spend a few moments now with our sponsor, Six Clicks. Six Clicks is your AI powered GRC platform featuring a fully integrated content library. Six Clicks provides organizations with a powerful GRC platform to build highly scalable risk and compliance functions and advisors with the tools to streamline and scale their services, saving everyone enormous time and money. Reimagine risk, improve cybersecurity, demonstrate compliance. For more information, visit sixclicks.com slash CISO series. Now we have to worry about SATA cables. The ever innovative researchers at Ben Gurion University doing the Lord's work have documented how SATA cables, those long seven pin cables, you use them in a PC to connect a motherboard to a hard drive or other uh, peripherals, can be used as an antenna to exfiltrate data. As usual for these types of exploits, the technique requires an already infiltrated mat- uh, machine. So it's kind of academic experiment at this point, although I talked to Stuxnet about that. However, it does reveal a weakness that had not been addressed when building these types of cables. Renee, does your spidey sense worry about the next step here, that a, a person or a team can read something like this, make something more sinister out of it? Ben Gurion University does this about, I don't know, once a year or something like that, where they say, hey, router, blinking router lights can be hacked to exfiltrate, to defeat an air gap, right? Um, I love these stories. They're always close to my heart. I'm curious, like... How I guess, how serious should we take these? You know, I think we're so focused on things that we worry about and know about today that we're really not thinking about emerging risks. So I don't want to panic. But at the same time, what I think the researchers are trying to prove is that if an adversary really wants to get to an air-gapped network, right, that they'll be able to do that. And you're right. You pointed out that the machine already had to be compromised. So it may not be easy, but it may not be impossible. So I think the takeaway from this one is that companies still need to start thinking about their OT risks. They need to think about their air gap and they need to think about physical security in the same breath. 
Yeah, and I have to give a shout out. Usually with these, it's just like menacing. Like they're just like, hey, here's this exploit. Uh, good luck, I guess, tape over your lights or don't use mechanical hard drives. In this one, they actually had a mitigation where they're like, we, you can actually introduce noise into your writes to defeat this, but it may burn out, especially if you're using an SSD, burn out your SSDs a little faster. But small price to pay perhaps for air gap security. Listen, if, if that's going to cause a critical infrastructure failure, then I say we worry about it now. Otherwise, I, I think we fix the first problem <laughs> that we have. <laughs> and then we'll worry about, yeah, the, the, everything else down the line. All right. Well, next up here, Car GPS Tracker exposes location data. This was a big story we covered this week. Security researchers at BitSight found six vulnerabilities in a GPS tracker from the company Mycotis. The tracker includes a hard-coded password that can be used to remotely control it, access real-time location data, see past routes, and even cut off fuel to vehicles. The tracker also ships with a default password of the very creative 123456. The researchers finding 95% of sample devices didn't bother to change it. The company claims that over 1.5 million hardwired GPS trackers in use across vehicle fleets, uh, national governments, militaries, and law enforcement. So this has a big footprint. You know, Renee, the story seems perfectly timed for comments uh, by FBI Assistant Director for Cyber, Brian Vorndran at Fordham University this week, when he asked, what happens when the adversary understands that there is perhaps one software factory that services an entire community? You know, here we have a B2B supplier basically pulling a SolarWinds attack on trucks, police cars, ambulances, military vehicles all over the world. I'm curious, what's your thought on What are your thoughts on this? Well, there's a couple of problems with this story, not the least of which is if you go online, I, I think I can still buy one of these things for eighteen ninety nine, and I can actually get a, a, a six uh, for six bucks. I can get an additional year of warranty. So my thinking here is that if you're a company and you put these things in, all right. Firstly, hopefully your procurement team knows that these things I think are manufactured in China. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is state sponsored because um, I really don't know. Um, whether that's true or not, but I think that it it, it paints uh, it tells the story that if you're going to put things into your equipment, use it for fleet, that uh, somebody should be involved from a cybersecurity perspective and actually be able to test the product and to look at it. The second thing is, and BitSight pointed out, that there was a web server attached to this thing. And I, I think it speaks to we need to know the systems that are on the network and those that are communicating on the Internet. And, and those are problems that I think we can solve. And, and again, yeah, we already are... Uh, have one software, you know, um, that everybody relies on. So it, but, but I'll come back to it for me as a CISO, it was always about what can I control? This is stuff that I can still control, including testing yeah. things on my network. Well, and especially uh, not to say that, uh, you know, uh, vehicles aren't, you know, terrestrial vehicles aren't extraordinarily complex, like they're, they're systems upon systems to make everything work. But we were talking about uh, a few weeks ago about maritime security and how like exponentially there are more systems from different vendors that you have to worry about securing slightly different problems there. But the same basic thing of we need to ensure that, especially as things become more automated, that, yeah, we know what's talking to the network. We know where these things are coming from. Again, I, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the old supply train. Drop. And and did anybody in IT even, did anybody in IT even know about that thing? I once had a camera on a network that was manufactured in China. And when the thing needed to be fixed, the, the, um, the manufacturer said, here's the hack to get the camera to start working again. And they literally said to hack the software. I'm like, oh get it goodness. off the network. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that is a interesting support call <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All you need to do is just root your device. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. next up here, Russian malware groups spoof pro-Ukrainian apps. Researchers at Google's threat analysis group discovered that the pro-Kremlin threat group Turla created an app called Cyber Azaz, which is aimed at Ukraine's far-right military unit. The app claims it launches a denial of service attack against Russian websites. We saw a number of these kind of websites and services kind of popping up when the uh, uh, invasion started. But instead, this app installs a Trojan on a user's device. So, Renee, you know, this is through a, a wartime context is basically a phishing scam, right? I mean, have you seen and on the civilian side any improvements when it comes to things like phishing awareness or prevention? And is this even like a user problem at this point? Well, again, I'm going to say there's two parts to this story. I watched an interview with Jane, uh, Janice Stolit, um, and she basically said that we have to assume that um, malicious software is part of the Russian playbook. So I think we all have to step up our game here. Um, with that being said, I think this was more social engineering because 
that the, the people that wrote that thing were actually trying to, you know, behave like they were part of the the good guy group, right? And and that's going to be hard. And it's going to be hard for your users. If somebody really wants to get inside your company, they are going to be able to socially engineer somebody in HR, I guarantee it, or somebody on your sales and marketing team to be able to do something and install something. So yes, I think we can do a better job training, but I think we have to start doing more targeted training. And again, the things that we can control are making sure that my endpoint, you know, uh, uh, products are working properly or that, you know, my gateways, my perimeter fences are actually doing what they should be doing. But I think it's it's going to be too hard. It already is too hard to blame users um, for falling victim to something that, that looks pretty real. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, a, a determined actor, right, has to succeed one yeah. time. And, and, you know, yeah. you, you can be, you can be, you have the, on a user side, you can be right 99.999% of the time. And it's that one time. Yeah. And I mean, I think the biggest thing is make sure your people no call if they have a question and they're not afraid of the security department. All right. Well, our final story today, TikTok is the fastest growing news source for the UK. This is according to a survey conducted by the UK government's Office of Communications. In addition, nearly half of people using TikTok for current affairs turn to fellow TikTokers rather than conventional news organizations for updates. Furthermore, a quarter of U.S. adults say they always use TikTok to get news with nearly half of U.S. millennial and Gen Z adults, those under 41s and under 25s respectively, indicating the same, according to the analysis firm Forrester Research. So, you know, Renee, what problems do you imagine will stem from increasing numbers of individuals choosing to receive their view of the world from TikTok influencers, which seems to be the way that we were going? Weren't we saying the same thing in, I don't know, 2010 when it came to people sharing news on Twitter? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I struggle with this story because I feel like what we're really talking about here is misinformation and disinformation, which I learned was the deliberate distribution of false information to cause harm. So I think that's really what we're talking about. And, you know, further on in the story, it said that three out of 10 people really don't take the news seriously, but they look for an opinion about the news. Um, but, you know, I also read that TikTok's doing something about it. They're they're putting in place algorithms and they're putting in place human moderators to try and, you know, mitigate the risk of, uh, again, of disinformation, which I think is probably the most serious problem that can come from this. But, um, you know, I started my career as a CISO at uh, Time Inc. At back then, journalists had to have three sources of truth before they could publish anything. I think if we're looking for news to actually always be right anymore and perfect, I think that that horse is out of the barn. Yeah. And I, I would say for I, I to me, if I'm a media organization, my thought is, if this is the case, then we need to find a way to meet people where they want to get yeah. the news. You know, uh, and I think uh, a news organizations were so late to get on that on other social platforms. I hope that this is a learn. You know, this is something that they can be like, okay, we can. There's a way forward with this. We know where people want to get their news. We need to figure out a way to do that. Yeah, I mean, go where the what is it? Go where the puck is going, or something like mm. that, or you know, skate where, yeah, where the puck is. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's where it's going, and 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 people need to. Pay attention. I mean, the, the signals are there. All right. Well, before we get out of here, Renee, any uh, story that uh, you reacted strongly to today, a thumbs up or an eye roller in the rundown today? I got an, a thumbs down, an eye roller, uh, you know, <laughs> makes Nails me so mad. Nails on chalkboard. It's it's that one with the critical infrastructure. And I think we need to basically, unless we all want to move off the grid and we don't want to go anywhere, I think we need to pay attention here. And we're taking too much for granted. And and government needs to help. But I think innovation also needs to step up and, 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 and really think about what we're going to do to address some of, like you said, climate change, things that are happening around us today. We need to solve for today. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Renee Gutman, the former CISO at Campbell Soup, Coca-Cola, and Time Warner. I so much appreciate your time today. It was just a wonderful conversation. Where can people find you if they are so inclined to follow you? They can find me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. And we'll have that. We have that up right now in the video feed. You can find it in the show notes as well. We, of course, also want to thank our sponsor, Six Clicks, AI-powered, integrated content, risk and compliance, reimagined. Remember to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday, where our topic will be hacking current events, an hour of critical thinking about how what's happening in the world can and will affect your security program. If you get that news on TikTok, even more power to you. Just go to CISOseries.com and click on the Super Cyber Friday icon to register. Of course, we'll be back next week with another week in review. 
the show starts always at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Mountain and Central People Time, you you know the deal. And finally, we can get you can still get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines. Give us about six minutes, we'll get you all caught up every single weekday. Until next week, I'm Rich Draffolino, reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOSeries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 